All right, welcome to the chapter six video for Math 120. Um, we'll just have two sections here. We're just gonna do one video, probably be a little bit longer then, um, but rather than splitting it up and me going to all that editing time, we'll just do one video. Um, let's jump into the first section here. What we're gonna be doing here is introducing, we're gonna be extending probability. So instead of looking at probability of particular events, we're going to define something that is a random variable and we're going to distinguish here um, actually we'll probably do this later we're going to talk about probability distributions um, the ones we're going to be looking at here in chapter six are going to be discrete probability so whole numbers probability of one or two or three uh, continuous random variables we'll talk about that um, a little bit more in chapter seven um, we'll also talk about the uh, mean of a discrete random variable and interpreting that. We'll talk a little bit about computing the variance in standard deviation, but you'll see a little note that you will not be tested on that objective. So let's talk about a random variable. What is a random variable? So let's suppose we have a fair coin and we're gonna flip it three times and count the number of heads. So we flip it the first time. Uh, from each of those, the second flip could be heads or tails. From each of those, this, the um, the flip could be heads or tails. So if we count the number of heads, uh, we could have 0, 1, 2, or 3, but not all with the same probability, uh, with the same frequency. So if we make a little table uh, and we have x uh, is the number of heads and then the probability, you can have either 0, 1, 2, or 3, but like I mentioned, they're not all the same probability. So if we look uh, on the uh, outcomes here, there is a single 0 there are three ones, three threes, and one three. So in terms of a probability, uh, we can have a probability of one out of eight that you'll get no heads, three out of eight that you'll get three heads, or one head, uh, three out of eight that you'll get two heads, and one out of eight that you'll get three heads. So this um, table here is called, this is one way to have a probability distribution where you're just explicitly stating what are the outcomes and what is the probability for each? That's one way to do a probability distribution. Later uh, in the next section, we'll talk specifically about um, some particular variables you can come up with formulas. Well, here's a formula for the probability, uh, but one way to do it is just to have a table. So the next question we wanna ask is, all right, so I have this random variable. How could I find the mean of it? Uh, so I've got a different example here. Suppose we have this example where we're rolling to uh, dice and we're looking at the sum. So if you look at the possibilities here, I could have two, I could have three a couple of different ways, I could have four three different ways, I could have five four different ways, etc. So if we look at the mean, if we go along the top row, I could have two or three or four, five, six, seven, then three, four, etc. All the way down to the last one is 12. But if we rearrange these a little, little bit and think about maybe like a weighted mean, we could have one two, there are two threes, three fours, all the way down there are two elevens over here and one twelve. So it's kind of like a weighted mean, but what if I rephrase this yet again and I kind of broke it up into all these different fractions. In fact, there'd be 11 different fractions. And I said, you know what, why don't I call this two times one thirty-six, three times two thirty-six, four times three thirty-six, etc. down to 12 times 136. And hopefully you're recognizing on that that those fractions, that's the probability. So if you look at this 136, that's the probability of getting a 2. 236, that's the probability of getting a 3. So this is really a probability statement. It's 2 times the probability of a 2, 3 times the probability of a 3, 4 times the probability of a 4, etc. And if you do all those computations, you'll get a seven, that on average we would expect a seven. Uh, sometimes it's gonna be less, sometimes it's gonna be more, uh, but the average is gonna be a seven. So if we think of the mean of a random variable formula that, that we can use for this, that it's the sum of all of the values times their probability. So it's the sum of the product of each possible outcome, um, multiplied by its uh, corresponding probability. And like I said there in the description, it's kind of like a weighted mean where the weights are the probabilities. So now, what does this mean? What can we interpret that? Well, if I go back here, you'll notice I didn't say 
well, I can expect a seven every time. No, that's not what it means. Sometimes I'm gonna be less. I could get a two, I could get a 12, I could get a three, I could get an eight. Um, but this is just in the long term, on average, if I do this over and over and over, the average result that I can get is a seven. So we go back to what does this mean? That mu sub x, the mean of the random variable, represents the long-term average. If I repeat this experiment again and again and again and again and again, this is what I can expect. This is probably the most important thing from this whole chapter. There's some other formulas we're gonna learn and they're interesting and, and they can occur and, and we'll talk about some, some applications for them. But this, what does this mean and how to use it is really the most important thing. Um, it's a really important outcome and it's a key result that's used in a lot of different areas, um, not just outside of probability. So we're gonna look at a couple of examples here and you're gonna to need to do all of the homework and dig up some more examples maybe in the study plan uh, or uh, in the online lesson to really practice some more. But we're gonna do a couple here. We're gonna start with uh, the game of roulette. So we have expected value here, the mean, that's the expected value. What, what's the long-term expected value, average value here? So what we have is in roulette, you have this wheel that spins around and then a ball that goes around and, and ends up falling on one particular spot. And in American roulette, there are 38 whole slots. There's zero, double zero, and then one through 36. Um, one particular bet you can make is called a dozen bet, where you bet on some particular set, like I'm gonna bet on one through 12, or I'm gonna bet on 13 through 24. So the question here we have is, if the payout is two to one, so you get your original money back plus double that, uh, what's the expected value of a $1 dozen bet? And we're gonna actually answer this question using um, uh, the mean of a random variable. So if we're gonna do that, um, the first thing we need to do is define a random variable. So here's what we're gonna do. We're interested in what is the expected value of this bet. So we're really interested in what's our expected profit. So we're gonna let X be equal to the net value, the profit or loss uh, of a dozen bet. And then actually there's only two possibilities, either you win or lose. Or either you win or you lose. So if, if you lose, you've lost your dollar. So the net value is negative one. If you win, you get back your dollar, so that's zero then, and then you get twice that. So if you win, you win two dollars. So those are the two options. We're gonna make a little table just like we did with the probability distribution for um, the flipping a coin. Except now our two possibilities are negative one if we lose, so our outcome is we, we lose a dollar, or two, we win two dollars. We actually would get three, We you know the dealer or whatever would give us three, but one of those was the original dollar we bet. So we're really only netting two. So now we need to find the probabilities of these. And we have to be careful um, because the game is unbalanced. So the game of roulette in American roulette has 38 slots. It has those two extra slots. Uh, that's actually what makes it unfair. It has those two extra slots. So if we're betting on a dozen, that means there are 26 remaining spots that are losses for us. So 26 out of 38 is the probability that we would lose. Uh, and when we win, there's only those 12 out of 38. Uh, doesn't seem like that's a big deal, uh, having those extra two numbers, but what happens is when we do the expected value and we have negative one times 26 out of 38 and two times 12 out of 38, these negatives are more, like if you look at this, obviously this is double here and it's positive but there's more than double the weight. And so if you calculate this, you actually get negative 2 38ths, which is about negative 0 0.05. And this is, the units here are dollars. So what this means is that in the long run, uh, you're gonna average a loss of about five cents per bet, per dollar bet. Now remember, this is a long-term average. So um, I'm not gonna lose five cents when I play. I'm gonna bet a dollar and either lose a dollar or win two dollars. Um, and so the, the point here is this is if you do this again and 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 keep doing this bet, your average profit per bet is gonna be negative five cents. The house always wins. Somebody might win at roulette, one have one big win, um, but if they keep playing, 
eventually they're going to average a negative. They're going to average a loss. Um, so this is an example of expected value, and this is this roulette is always a negative expected value. In fact, every roulette bet has a negative five cent expected value. Okay, uh, next one. Uh, this one here is different context. We're talking about a blood disease, and um, we have a clinic or hospital that want, needs to test its patients to see if they have this certain disease. Um, this particular disease is, uh, let's see here, people are coming to the clinic, and again, we're kind of, this is a situation that's, that's just made up by this author here, but it's, it, it's plausible. So people are coming to the clinic in groups of 50, and the doctor's wondering, you know what, instead of testing, or the director here, instead of testing them each individually, why don't we take blood samples from them all, pool their blood together, and then test that pool. If the pool's negative, everybody's healthy, done. If the pool's positive, then we'll test each of the 50 people. So the question is, what's the average number of tests we would expect if we did this? I mean, obviously, if we test each person individually when they come in, we're going to have 50 tests every time. Uh, if we pool it, sometimes we're only going to have one test. Uh, and other times, though, we'll have to have the one test and testing everybody individually, so we'll have 51. So the question then is, what is the expected number of tests if we pool the blood samples? Okay, so let's make a random variable. We're going to let x be the number of tests required. And so we said, all right, there's a couple of key pieces of information here. If we pool it, um, we can just say they're healthy. If not, uh, we'll test them each individually. All right, so let's look at the expected value. We're gonna define a random variable as x is the number of tests required. We're gonna make a probability distribution like we did before. And again, we just have two options here. Either we have one, uh, which means that uh, we pooled the 50 blood samples together, we ran the test, it was negative, everybody's healthy, we're done, one test, nice. The second possibility is that we pooled the blood together, we tested it, it was positive, so there's somebody has the disease, but we don't know who. So we have to run 50 tests then, in addition to the one, to see who, um, who has it. So um, that would be 51 total. So let's look at the probability of one. The probability that we have one test is the probability that we just have to run it once. Nobody has the disease. So that's just um, 49 out of 50. Um, oh, no. Dang. All right, so let's um, set up an expected value calculation here. We said we said uh, x was the number of tests we're going to require. And so just like before the previous example, uh, let me get going here. Let's see. We have two possibilities. Either x is 1, meaning we pool all the 50 together. We run a blood test. It's negative. Nobody's got it. Everybody's clear. We're done. Second possibility is that test comes back positive. So then we have to do 50 more tests, each of the 50 individuals. So that would give us 51 total. So let's look at the probability um, of, of one, just one test. That means nobody has the disease. So if we go back, um, go all the way back here. Whoa, too far. Sorry. Um, one person in 100 has this disease. So that means that the probability that none have it would be 99 out of 100 to the 50th. That we're assuming, this is a big assumption now, but we're assuming that it's random who has the disease or not. Um, that's not always obvious, but we can make that a reasonable assumption here that, um, that there, there's no relationship of likelihood to have this disease between two people. You know, that is not always the case, certainly. Um, if people are genetically related, so there could be some increased odds. But we're just going to say they're all independent, so they're equally likely to have it or not have it. So 99 out of 100 to the 50th. So that's 0 0.605. If we look at the probability that we'd have to do 51 tests, um, well, that would be the probability that at least one person has the disease, which is the complement. And so we can just use the complement idea, 1 minus the previous one, so we get 0.395. So when we do our expected value, we take 1 times that probability, 51 times the other probability, we get about 
So that means if we did this, uh, if the director did pooling the 50, we'd only have to do 21 tests instead of 50. So that would be a huge savings. You know, once in a while, basically what would happen here is sometimes you'd have to do 51, which would be one more. But once in a while, 60% of the time, 61% of the time, you'd get lucky and you only have to run one test. So there's a lot of net savings there. You'd have to do a lot less tests than just testing every one one at a time. So there's a great example of using expected value to help uh, solve a real problem. All right, last thing we want to talk about is a standard deviation of a random variable. So we know the mean of, if we did these, uh, the two dice, we know the mean of the sum of the two dice was seven. So what about the standard deviation? We know the variance of a, of, um, a, a variable is you take the value minus the mean, you square it, you add all those up uh, and divide by n. You take the average squared deviation from the mean, that's the variance. So if we do that here, we would take all of these values um, and subtract them from the mean and square it, and then we've got some repetition. So we know we know we have two threes, we have three fours, um, and so we can set it up just like a previous one, where essentially we're taking the distance from the mean and squaring it, but then weighting it by the probability. And so what we have is another formula for, in this case, the variance, and then we could just take the the square root if we need the square root. All right, so the standard deviation of a random variable is um, we add up all of the deviations from the mean squared times their probability uh, and then take the square root of that. So this is a formula that's really just one that I want you to maybe do once or twice in your homework, but it's not something that's needed very often. Really the only thing we're interested in or the thing we're interested in most often when we do random variables is what's the average? What's the long-term average for this? So we're not going to be asked this particular question on the exam. All right, so that's it for 6.1, um, the introduction to discrete random variables. What is a random variable? What's a probability distribution? And what does it mean? Uh, what does, what's the mean? And what does that mean or expected value mean? What is the meaning behind that?